Good evening. Thank you uh, very much for coming out and uh, for going the preseason game that I thought no one would go to, but apparently I was very, very wrong. Uh, on this episode of uh, Policy Pizza and a Pint, uh, we have uh, uh, the topic is the throne speech. And uh, our panel uh, this evening is going to situate the throne speech and uh, talk to you a bit about how it works and uh, then you'll have to talk to them and ask questions. Um, is uh, Paul Vogt, uh, the Executive in Residence at the Management Institute for Policy Research, where you may know him better as the former Clerk uh, of Executive Council and Cabinet Secretary. Um, to my right is uh, the Honorable Dave Chomiak, uh, Minister in Innovation, Energy, and Mines. My right, right? That's my right. Uh, first elected in 1990, NDP MLA for Kildonan. And to my left, and apparently my politics didn't get set up correctly, is Ron Schuler, the MLA for St. Paul, um, Chris Conservative, critic for Workmen's Compensation Board, Manitoba Liquor Control Commission, Sport in Manitoba, and he was first elected in 1999. Um, short introductions, uh, normally long introductions are to situate what the experts might know about the throne speech. Um, all three of these gentlemen have been around it for a long time, and uh, look forward to hearing what they have to say tonight. Thank you. Did, we, uh, did you guys do the rock, paper, scissors to figure out who's going first? Paul. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, this is, this is where we get to do the double entendre, where we start on the left, except uh, actually from where you guys are sitting, Ron, you're on the left. So, okay, right. Okay, Paul, go ahead. That's strange. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, let, let me say it's, it's an honor to be up here with, uh, with Dave and Ron. Um, uh, some of you who may have been following the, uh, uh, the question period of last summer uh, come away with the conclusion that politics is something of a blood sport, but uh, I can assure you that, um, that these two people uh, that I'm on the stage with are, are two people who are both well-respected and also well-liked uh, throughout the, uh, the legislature, including by the people on the opposite side. And, uh, you know, just again to, to sort of humanize that, that building a little bit, uh, I don't think I've ever come across Ron uh, in the hallway of the legislature without getting a, a, a friendly hello and, uh, and, a, and a quick chat. And uh, as far as Dave is concerned, uh, I think a lot of people may, <laughs> may know him from that, those, those grim-faced uh, scrums he had to do as health minister, uh, uh, <clears throat> explaining this or that and projecting that look of, uh, of kind of hairy concern. Uh, but I can also tell you that, uh, that behind the scenes is actually one of the funniest uh, people in the building. And, uh, I think maybe if we have a few more pints uh, as, as we go forward, he'll, he'll be persuaded to do his Elvis impersonation uh, by, by the end of the night. Um, the topic that, uh, that we were given was, uh, is the throne speech still relevant? And uh, I'm going to argue quite strongly that, that it is, um, but I get why people would, would ask that question. So I'll try at the end and sort of look at both sides and uh, I'll also say a little bit about uh, what we, we should look for on, on November 12th, uh, which is going to be the, the next throne speech uh, uh, start the session. Um, first of all, uh, there's no doubt the uh, throne speech is one of the more ceremonial uh, parts of the, uh, the legislative calendar and uh, on November 11th we'll start with uh, guns being fired on the lawn of the legislature, uh, there'll be an honor guard review by the lieutenant governor. Uh, and then when he walks into the chamber in early afternoon to, to deliver the speech following the mace, uh, he'll be accompanied by an aide who, who always wears uh, pants made out of the tartan of Manitoba, which is not a fashion statement you see every day. So, uh, <laughs> uh, And then when it's all over after the speech has been given, and generally speaking, actually, uh, I think MLAs are on their absolute best behavior, given that it's the lieutenant governor who's actually doing, doing the reading. Uh, there might be some, some winks or... Uh, uh, pointed fingers across the way, but otherwise pretty quiet. And uh, and then when it's all over, as the uh, as the lieutenant governor walks out, uh, the MLAs all join together in, in pretty rousing versions of both "God Save the Queen" and, and "O Canada." Uh, so there's actually, you know, as I said, there's a, there's a fair bit of pomp, and there's even uh, a measure of civility which lasts for uh, oh, about five minutes, I guess, until the scrums begin <laughs> in, in the rotunda. Um, but, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, for that reason, it actually, I think it's something that goes against uh, probably the, uh, you know, the, the relevance, uh, the sense of relevance of the throne speech. And I'll talk about, a little bit more about that at the end. But, you know, I think, you know, this is the first take. It's kind of feels a little bit like the, uh, you know, the national anthems that, uh, that start a hockey game and, uh, and sort of the, you know, the other formalities that take place before the actual uh, drop of the puck. Uh, but I'm going to argue that in, in thinking that, uh, you'd be very wrong. 
Uh, throne speech actually does, uh, even though it has some of its own kind of formal flourishes and archaic expressions, uh, it really does present, um, as I, the, the blurb advertising this event said, uh, uh, the roadmap, uh, or if you will, the game plan uh, of the government for, for the coming year. And uh, it's actually, I would argue, it's the only document uh, where you're going to see all of the policy priorities that are on the government's mind uh, in the same place and from the way in which they're placed in the speech and the amount of room that's given to each one, you're actually going to get, get a bit of a sense of how they're ranked. Um, so uh, it's, it's sort of, uh, I actually think it's, it's, it's an important uh, context for all the politics that takes place in the coming year. but. But because of the, uh, the disregard, that, and I think that's grown over time, it's almost something that's, uh, that's hidden in plain sight. Uh, when I was uh, a clerk and uh, gave, gave talks to, to uh, people in the civil service, uh, I always told them to read the throne speech very carefully. Uh, it's, it's only 16, 17 pages, double-spaced, uh, it's not a long read, uh, but every single word in that document uh, has been fussed over, fretted over, sometimes fought, uh, or lobbied over. Um, the government has really put a lot into it, and, and of course, you know, the final say uh, on, on every line in the throne speech uh, uh, goes, goes to the Premier. And so, uh, it's not just a document for the public, it actually is also a document uh, for government talking to itself. It's a signal uh, to all of the units of government uh, of, you know, what, what their marching orders are, uh, what they have to get started on, uh, who's going to be uh, under the gun or in the spotlight in the coming year, and then by implication, uh, it also kind of tells you who's not. Um, you know, it could be that uh, your unit has uh, important priorities that could be very valuable, but uh, you're not on the dance card for that for that coming year. Um, so I think it is a it is a, a very valuable document. I mean, to be sure, it's it's high level. Um, you don't get uh, the numbers uh, on on what things will cost. That that comes a couple months later uh, in the, in the budget. Um, but it is, a, it is an absolutely fundamental uh, document for putting uh, what's going to happen in the legislature over the coming uh, months in, into some kind of context. And just to add to that, uh, I actually uh, spent a bit of time, and you may think this is sort of almost masochism, but I, I went, you know, and it's, it's not hard to do, I went and read past throne speeches going back to, uh, to 99. They're all online. Uh, in fact, a lot of them are in their kind of condensed uh, media bullet point uh, format. Uh, so it's quite easy to scan them. And I actually thought it was quite uh, accurate how they indicated both uh, what was constant in, in government policy over that period and, and registered uh, the, the important shifts that took place. And uh, you know, I won't, won't be long on this, but just, just very briefly to, to get into some, some of the content. Uh, uh, back in 1999, uh, the NDP ran on a platform which it, it actually put on a a five-point pledge card. Uh, this was ripped off shamelessly from British Labour, which had used the five-point pledge card for its own campaign a couple of years before. Um, but it was, uh, the, the, in order, it was health, education, uh, economy, public safety, environment. That's where the, the commitments were. And it's always struck me that that essentially, both the priorities uh, and also the ranking of the priorities uh, has set the, the, uh, the structure for the throne speech ever since and really is a very good indication uh, of, of the way that the government uh, ranks those priorities. Um, and, and then, I mean, with that structure, you can then chart the different changes. If you look through the throne speeches, uh, there's no doubt that there's been evolution within the framework. Uh, in health, we went from a focus on rebuilding, which was a little bit about capital, a little bit about health professionals, but, but very quickly started to move into uh, issues of prevention and, uh, and access or innovations uh, in service. Education uh, went from a real focus on the post-secondary system and expanding it, the tuition commitment, uh, through early childhood, uh, through uh, high school completion, and most recently a real emphasis on the skills or vocational uh, agenda. Uh, and so on. Uh, I think you know another another shift very interesting is that the environment has always been there, but for a number of years it was all Kyoto, uh, so all about atmospheric uh, pollution, and has shifted very decisively towards water uh, pollution and also of course water management, uh, with the floods as uh, as a major theme. Uh, and then individual throne speeches uh, kind of takes you right back there to to you know particular the the 2001 throne speech. More than half of it is responses to 9/11, uh, 
the 2002 throne speech uh, really laid out the economic agenda coming out of the, the Century Summit that's been the framework ever since then for, for economic policy uh, in the province. So anyway, lots of, you know, both, both the, the, the yearly context and also if you want to get, give yourself uh, a quick education in the policy shifts uh, of the last uh, decade, 15, well, 20 years, however long you want to go back, uh, throne speeches are, are incredibly valuable documents. But having said that, uh, not a whole lot of people read them. And, uh, and in fact, even a lot of people who cover the legislature uh, don't read the, the throne speech, and, uh, and that's you know, evidence in a lot of the coverage uh, that comes afterwards. Uh, I think there's uh, and a lot of the things I just talked about um, are not part of at all of the coverage uh, that uh, or the discussion that, that takes place in, in the days afterwards. So there is an issue there um, that I think you know that we have to contend with, uh, you know, despite the, the case I'm making. Uh, I think there's generally a, perhaps a shortened attention span or a focus on on the moment uh, that uh, uh, amongst the general public. Uh, there's also, I think, um, there's something about the pomp. Of the, of the throne speech itself, which is very off-putting both to the average person and perhaps also to the media, who I think have come to see it as a kind of very elaborate facade that they have to get behind to, uh, to get the real story. And, uh, and lastly, I would say that uh, I think government has started to cater to that kind of jadedness about the throne speech. And uh, uh, once upon a time, uh, a former boss of mine, whose name I won't mention, used to talk about sort of you know, showing a little thigh in the, uh, in the throne speech. Uh, you can actually you can take that whichever way you want to be politically correct, but um, I'd like you to tell me which speech <laughs> yes, that was. <laughs> well, my lips are sealed. I'm I sworn miss, to I miss the five. <laughs> uh, more, more recently, actually, we've talked about uh, shiny pennies in the, in the throat speech. Uh, you know, things like liquor in supermarkets or uh, maybe free cancer drugs. Uh, and so there's actually a little bit of a catering to. I mean, these are these are legitimate policy, but they're they're more policy nuggets than they are the framework that, that the throne speech is supposed to be. So, in fact, I think the government is already conceding that uh, the, the kind of interest uh, that you might expect from a document like that uh, uh, is not is not widespread. Um, but I I would stick to my guns. I I think it's an incredibly important document, and I think on November twelfth. You know, we have a context now where government's gone through a frustrating summer. Arguably, the whole chamber has gone through a frustrating summer. Um, uh, the question of you know all of the big issues that are dealt with in the throne speech, the, the demographic challenges, the economic, the environmental, uh, the, the fading role of the federal government, all of those uh, are very much in front of the government. Um, but clearly now, uh, you know, the need to make a statement which defines uh, the next two years of the mandate. Uh, and restores momentum. Uh, I think should should create uh, uh, if if any throne speech uh, you know was uh, was going to garner some interest, uh, it should be this one. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. I'm going to have actually pass over to Ron. Uh, well, unless Ron, you really want to you know bring it home. I want to bring it home. Thank okay, you. then we'll defer. He's the minister. We're yeah. Quite right. Okay. <laughs> Did you realize that you were outranked, Dave, on the panel? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. I, I defer to okay. Paul. Okay. I, I agree with everything Paul says. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of why I wanted Ron to go. Uh, but, you know, uh, Dave, say something that Paul didn't say. Well, uh, actually, three things uh, jumped to mind. Uh, ritual, discipline, and compass were the three things that, uh, that came to mind. First is I, I, I read through all the throne speeches going back to when I was first elected in 1990. And I was struck by the fact that the majority of the targets um, illustrated in the throne speech were met by government, regardless of political strife. Uh, there, was a, there was clearly a, a differentiation between uh, uh, the throne speeches of the, the government uh, between 90 and 99, when I was in opposition, and between 99 and, and, and the last throne speech, you can differentiate. But in both cases, uh, most of the targets were met. So. Uh, in that sense, the throne speech serves as a good discipline on government and as a compass for, for where we're going. Uh, and it's internally very much an important uh, aspect. Most of us, you probably can't tell me what the mission statement is of the free press, but you have a mission statement, right? Yeah, but it, the, it involves uh, the uh, 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 liberty, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of trade, freedom of something else. And Latin. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's it's uh, you know charming, but not necessarily relevant. You know, 
So in the sense of the throne speech, it does, in my review, it, it, it did serve to show that, uh, that, that it served as a kind of compass where we were going as a government. Now, I was in the private sector, and that's why I mentioned mission statements, because we always, I mean, I remember fretting in the private sector when we were doing an annual report about what our mission statement was as a corporation. And no one reads that. But it does serve, it does serve as a check and a compass on where you're going. And it does serve as a bit of a, uh, as a marker and a discipline on you from year to year and from category to category. So that's why I think compass and uh, discipline are important with respect to the throne speech. And the point that I think that's really relevant that most of the public doesn't give us credit for. I've always said that 80% of the legislation goes through the legislature unanimously. And 90% uh, of what I've read in the throne speeches going back to 1990 uh, were brought into some form of operation by the governments. So the governments did pay attention to that. The final thing was ritual, and it's a, it's, it's a fascinating issue, and I don't want to get into it, but I remember going to a bunch of, talking to a bunch of atheists in, um, in BC. Of course, it has to be BC, right? And uh, they were having a, they, they were a bunch of atheists, and they had to have a ritual, because they said, you know, we don't believe in God, but we need a ritual, because we really miss that. And uh, they had to have this whole forum of ritualistic, uh, uh, activities because they missed ritual. So that, I don't like ritual that much, and yet uh, the point that Paul was making about the, 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 the ritual that we go through in throne speech is, is somewhat relevant, and it does serve somewhat to discipline us, to remind us, you know, that this guy wearing the tartan of Manitoba is, is a reflection, and that the lieutenant governor is a reflection of the law that goes back probably you know, five, six hundred years, and all of those ritualistic actually serve to remind us, at least in the legislature, where we have the, the statue of Moses and the statue of Saul, and that we're lawmakers, and that this is a forum where we fight with words, you know, we fight with words, and the mace is there because the mace was originally intended to protect the speaker from being, um, uh, from being uh, attacked by individuals around them, but all of this ritual does serve even in a small mind like mine, to, uh, to, to, to remind us of why we're there and what we do at the forum, that is the forum that we're in in the legislature, to fight with words and to make laws, and that there's something quite important about that. There's something that, that, that makes us rise above um, just simply partisan political politics. And certainly on throne speech day, that's there. So that was my that's my contribution to this discussion. Great, Ron. Just as you wanted to. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, whenever you criticize any part of a democratic institution, you have to be careful because you might get what you wish for. And I I say that with with all due respect to a lot of individuals who would like to see you know a Senate abolished, whatever. And I always think you should be very careful. So. I, I take on the throne speech part of it, and I, I do have some criticisms. Uh, I first of all want to say that I, I really do think it's important to have some kind of pomp and circumstance. I mean, there is there is something about democracy. Um, it has done us very well. The fact that we're allowed to be here and 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 debate the very institution that uh, that now I'm going to. Uh, have some criticism of. Uh, I'm an opposition member, I've been there 15 years, and yeah, uh, by the way, you got my title wrong. I'm actually the critic for hydro and energy, which is interesting because the minister on stage happens to be the minister for hydro and, and energy. So um, I've, uh, uh, I think I've asked Dave 180 questions in question period um, the last session, and there is a reason why it's called question period, not question and answer period. Never answered one of them, so I have to keep asking. <laughs> we didn't want to go to question period. So, throne speech. Uh, I've been through 15 of them, and Dave, I hope you're not trying to say that the mission statement for government is a throne speech, because so far I've heard 15 mission statements. And it, it's neat. I mean, if you've never been, the Canon thing, I, we had an exchange student last year. I took her outside, and they showed off these cannons. And every year, all the alarms go off in the car, and you know the LG shows up, and, and they have this great band inside. And who sees it? Nobody. 
I mean, unless you've got a special invitation. Hey, the building's not big enough to bring you know, 10,000 people in, right? So a very select few people actually get to see this really neat process. And I always try to bring guests, try to bring a lot of young people to actually see it because it's really cool, but nobody sees it. And then the speech itself, and, and again, I hesitate to criticize any facet of democracy because it affords us all of this, you know, the great life we have. So uh, I think the, the throne speech has become a political statement. Uh, this is what we plan on doing, and then I'm glad to hear that's usually what governments do. Uh, that's a good thing, because they sort of lay it out and then they do it. Um, the, the problem is that the way it's communicated, um, I, I will couch my words very carefully because I, I won't use my, my kids as kind of language. Um, you have an individual, he gets up and reads a speech and somehow that's how we communicate to the public. And if you're lucky, you might see a little clip of it on TV, but I think the media has, has bored of this a long time ago. So how do we communicate that to the public? And we don't. So basically we have this great show that we invite a few people to, and nobody shows up. Really, the public's not really interested. We can't communicate it because it doesn't Twitter very well. And you know, I'm going to try to put a photo on Facebook that we talked about this, but even that has, you know, that, that's kind of lame. My concern is, and it's not just about throwing speech; it's about our democracy in general. I I don't know how many of you play RuneScape, Dave. No, I was at a parliamentary conference and I asked. The, the room of parliamentarians, how many of them knew what RuneScape was and nobody raised their hand. And RuneScape, by the way, is an online game where you play the entire world and um, I would sooner chew off my right arm than play it, but I, I have a household that, that plays RuneScape. And it's actually not even the most modern thing. How do we connect with a generation, with our democracy, with its pomp and circumstance, with its you know, great stuff that, that by and large has no resonance with the public and you know it's great you know politicians insider baseball we take every word apart you know what do we mean by and you know and the like like is it really the that we want there you know great we spend all that time and effort for who for us and, you know we are going to have to do better if we want to communicate and I see some young faces in this room I mean you're probably here because your mark depends on it but you know um, or it's your job. Um, yeah, you get paid for it. I mean, look at the room. I mean, you know, where are our young people that we've got to connect that message to? And I know that the NDP probably struggles with that as much as the Liberals and, and the Conservatives do. It's great that we have a throne speech. Maybe we should do one a term, maybe two a term. You know, I've been through 15 of them, and, and there were some criticism in, in some quarters, and we won't point any fingers tonight about the fact that we sat for six months and it was $12,000 a day and we were wasting the public's money. Well, you should see the throne speech debate. You know, good thing the public doesn't see that either and that the media is tuned out on it. Because, I mean, what are we really debating? And, and governments show what they're actually going to do and do what they're going to do with their budget and with their legislation. And I would say the throne speech has really become insider baseball not to be too harsh, but it's a little bit of navel gazing. And who are we communicating it to other than the 50 cent plus and some invited guests? And so I just put that out there. And um, you know, all the policy wonks, and thank you, you laid it out beautifully, and I've always respected your, your, um, your brilliance. Uh, the thing is that there's got to be a wider audience. And I think we should start looking at some of these things and say, okay, other than for us, who are we doing this for?